I'm Citizen Spokeswoman Ruth Wasserman Landing. Today is August 28th, 2024. This is the daily briefing of the Israeli Citizen Spokesperson's Office. We are live on Instagram, X, YouTube, and LinkedIn, and available afterwards wherever you can get your podcasts. Please start submitting questions in the chat, and as always, like and subscribe to help us reach a wider audience. Today is day 327 of the October 7 war. You've all heard the good news. Israel brought another of our hostages home from Hamas terror dungeons. Kaid Farhan al kadi is a Muslim Israeli who was cruelly held 326 days by Hamas. Some were surprised to hear Muslims in Gaza hold Muslim hostages. The Jewish state risks soldiers to rescue them. Hamas claims that it is the Islamic resistance movement. Hamas also says that it's fighting against the Jews for the Muslims. A little bit embarrassed by the rescue, Hamas now claims that Qaed was unintentionally held hostage for 11 months, yes? Hamas are cynical liars. Everyone knows that Hamas are savage killers. They simply do not value human life. The idea that Hamas wouldn't kidnap Muslims from Israel is absolutely ridiculous. When the same Hamas regularly endangers the lives of Palestinian Muslims in Gaza by hiding amongst them and using them as human shields. Qaid is one of many Muslims kidnapped, wounded, and or murdered by Hamas on October 7th. At least three Muslim Israelis are still held hostage by Hamas. Hisham is Sayyid is a mentally handicapped young man held by Hamas for almost an entire decade. At least seven Muslims were murdered by Hamas rockets on October 7th, including four teenage brothers whose home was directly hit. At least 19 Muslims were murdered by Hamas terrorists, executed by Hamas death squads in Kibbutzim, driving on the roads and at the beach. Fatma El Talakat, mother of nine, was on her way to work. Despite her religious head covering, the hijab, clearly identifying her as a Muslim woman, she was shot 40 times by Hamas terrorists. Many Muslim Israelis risked their own lives to save innocent people from Hamas on October 7. Osama Abu Asa, a security guard at the Nova Music Festival, was murdered, protecting young festival goers hiding in a bomb shelter. He thought Hamas wouldn't kill him because he was a Muslim. Minivan driver Yusuf al Ziadna risked his life to rescue Nova festival goers. He saved 30 people by driving through Hamas gunfire. His cousin was sadly murdered while doing the same thing. Many Muslim Israelis risked their own lives in order to save the lives of innocent Israelis. After his rescue and reunification with his family, Kaid received a call from Israel's Prime Minister sharing how happy all of Israel is to have him safely back home. While Israel fights to preserve life, Hamas sanctifies death. While Israel is literally breaking Hamas in the Gaza Strip, there is still a long way to go in order to eliminate it completely as a threat. At the same time, there are six more fronts in which Israel is fighting. Hamas and the Islamic Jihad in the West Bank, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Shiite militias in Syria, Shiite militias in Iraq, the Houthis in Yemen, and Iran itself. Israel is fighting for its survival against enemies that want to eliminate and destroy it. The Islamic Republic of Iran wants to light the Middle East on fire and simply watch it burn. The West Bank, 
the Judea and Samaria hills surrounding Jerusalem and overlooking Tel Aviv serve as a launch pad for multiple attacks against innocent people in Israel. Last week, a Hamas suicide bombing was narrowly averted in Tel Aviv. Countless lives could have been destroyed. Last night, Israel's security forces carried out counter-terror raids to prevent the next murderous attack. One of the terrorists killed in the fighting was actually in prison until November when Hamas demanded Israeli release him in exchange for releasing hostages. Think about it. Israel is doing all it can to release those held by Hamas, as well as the remains of those who were murdered by the terrorist organization so that they can be brought to respectful burial in Israel with their families. In fact, Israel is trying to prevent the next October 7th from whichever front, while Hamas is trying to guarantee yet another October 7th. Israel fights for never again. Hamas fights for again and again and again. Let's take some questions now from our audience watching live on social media. Questions for you today, Ruth. Um, the, we have a lot of questions for you today. We have a lot of questions for you today, Ruth. Uh, the first question comes from Ali who asks, the Iranian ambassador to Lebanon, Dr. Montana Amani, was rumored to have fled to Israel. Why would he do that? Well, first of all, we do not have a confirmation uh, on the fact that he did, in fact, flee at all or to Israel in particular. Um, had we had that kind of confirmation, of course, it would be better for his own health and uh, survival for us not to mention it at all. But in fact, there is um, kind of um, um, a recurring event amidst the elite of the Islamic Republic of Iran, turning against their own leadership because of what it is doing and because they are fed up with what is happening in Iran itself. And this one can be seen as an example, in fact, as a kind of an expression of the discomfort, um, the disrespect, uh, the disengagement of the actual elite from their own leadership. I would imagine that this would be an example of that. Max on X asks, Egypt has reportedly refused a compromise that keeps Israel on the Philadelphia corridor. What is their interest? Why do they want to enable Hamas to resume smuggling weapons? So Egypt has been actually following a kind of a dual um, policy. On the one hand, it is a very strong strategic partner with Israel with a peace of over 40 odd years, no war, and that is something huge that one should treasure. On the other hand, we saw when the IDF entered the um, uh, Rafah region, and in fact went closer to the uh, Philadelphia line, that there were endless tunnels going from the Gaza side of Rafah into the Egyptian side of uh, Rafah. And this kind of number of tunnels and the width of the tunnels and the length of the tunnels simply cannot be overlooked or, or a little thing that the government or the regime in Egypt did not okay, which means, in fact, that a green light was given. Hence, we understand that there was a cooperation or an understanding between the Egyptian regime and the Hamas. Now that's very confusing because the Egyptian regime hates Hamas. They see them as part of the Muslim Brotherhood, as a threat to their own regime. So how do we understand it? First, there are elite people on the Egyptian side that actually got money from the smuggling. But that's not the whole story. There was probably some kind of an understanding that the Hamas would not cooperate with ISIS on the Egyptian side of the border, in other words, the ISIS that was in the Sinai Peninsula, in return for turning a blind eye on the smuggling. Now, 
the Egyptians well understand that this smuggling is illegal and what is being smuggled apart from people and terrorists is in fact parts and uh, dual use uh, things that are used for uh, weapons in order to kill, maim, rape, slaughter and burn innocent civilians, whether they're Palestinians or Israelis. And therefore, there's an issue. Now, on the one hand, as I said, there is an interest on the Egyptian side to uh, counter Hamas. The Hamas killed Egyptian soldiers in 2012 when it entered Egypt and killed them. And as I said, they're part of the Muslim Brotherhood, a threat to the Egyptian regime. But on the other hand, there was a kind of an understanding for sure, because there's no way that the Egyptian government could have allowed or this could have happened without them giving the green light and allowing them to take place. And therefore, we see this duality in the Egyptian policy. That is something we need to live with and to counter in some manner. On Instagram, I haven't made a name, asks, what do the Arab leaders have to say about the rescue of Qaeda? Do they share support? So it's very interesting because the um, Muslim Brotherhood and the Hamas were relatively silent because they were completely embarrassed. But afterwards, they tried to lie their way out of it and say that this was done by mistake. And then he was released. Yes, released only after 11 months. It took them 11 whole entire months to understand that this person was in their uh, captivity and in their hands. Of course, this is a blatant lie, but the Arab world and the actual social media did uh, relate the fact that there is something fishy in this whole uh, situation. And hopefully the world will wake up to the fact that these terrorists, they don't only retaliate in their so-called uh, language against Jews. They retaliate against Westerners. They retaliate and they attack Muslims. In fact, when they hide behind civilians in Gaza itself, making civilian Palestinian Muslims lose their lives, this is endangering uh, Gazan lives. And there were already statements made by Muslim Arab leaders about that, that Hamas is a threat to Muslims within Gaza. In fact, Abu Mazen, the so-called president of the Palestinian people, the one that is recognized worldwide in the West Bank, said the same thing. We need to remember, of course, that the Fatah, headed by Abu Mazen, and the Hamas are arch enemies. But there is an understanding a clear understanding by most of the Arab leaders of what is Hamas, not only endangering Jews, not only endangering Westerners, in fact, radical Islam endangers the West, but also the Arab states and Muslims in general. And this is something that needs to be regurgitated. It needs to be sent out as a message to the world. And also, to the Arab-speaking public out there because the Arab media does not do this enough and most of it is colored in a certain way to serve Hamas, like, for example, Al Jazeera, which says definitely what Hamas wants it to say to the world. We have a number of questions about citizen spokesman Elon Levy's appearance on Al Arabiya. Are the Saudis really cracking down on radical Islam and working towards normalization? So in my humble opinion, for a long time now, the Saudis have a vested interest in actually moving towards normalization. It's not necessarily out of complete rosy love for the Jewish state of Israel, but out of interest. And that's legitimate because they understand, first of all, what is radical and extreme Islam. If anybody understands what it is, the Saudis understand, by the way, the Egyptians understand, the Bahrainis understand, the Emiratis understand. And why? Because they all felt it. They all experienced it. They all know that it's a threat 
to the well-being of their own people and definitely to the survival of the regimes. And therefore, they need to join hands in a coalition with like-minded countries and partners in the region, including Israel, to fight this kind of terrorism, by the way, funded, encouraged, and pressed by the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Shiite malice that actually wants to reignite the region, to actually cause fire within the region. And that's why in the first place, Saudi Arabia wanted to move towards Israel, wanted to move towards the West. Did they fight radical Islam within them? Of course they did. If you just hold a Palestinian flag, a Palestinian flag in Saudi Arabia, like, for example, a woman, a Muslim woman did in Mecca when she went on the Hajj. You know what happened to her? She was taken by the Saudi police. In the United Arab Emirates, if you say anything or you demonstrate for the Palestinian cause, you're shut down. You're moved out of the country like one of the students that did so recently in the United Arab Emirates. Why is that? Because they hate Palestinians? No, because they know that if they allow extremism, if they allow radicalism, if they allow the terrorists and the extremists to take ownership of the Palestinian issue and take it hostage for their own purposes, their own radical purposes, their own extremism, in order to sabotage the um, peaceful society, in order to sabotage the well-being of general public, they stop it right there without asking questions. And it's much more than the West does, Europe, United States, Israel. That's why radical Islam is flourishing in Europe and in the United States of America and in Canada and in Australia and not flourishing in the Arab states. I hope that answers your question. Our last question comes from YouTube, where we're asked, what should people in the diaspora do when they see flight attendants wearing Palestinian flags? It's scary. Absolutely. It's not only that. In general, when people serving a certain public that needs to be neutral, including Jews, Westerners, Israelis, etc., wear any kind of sign that signifies that they are specifically aligned with one side of the conflict, it should be reported immediately and have relevant people send letters to the Congress people, to the owners of the flight companies or whatever other company that is relevant in which this takes place. It has been done before, it has been successful, and it shouldn't happen. And you can take action, you should take action, and your action will have impact. So go for it. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Drop a comment below. Don't forget to like, share, and hit subscribe to stay updated with our latest content. Until next time, stay informed and inspired. This is Dijabnik signing off.